Ring of Fire, I'm Mike Papantonio. Today on Ring of Fire, we'll tell you what President Obama is doing to help crack down on corporate tax cheats. There are a lot of them out there right now. We'll also look at the economic cost of Republican obstruction, and we'll explain how poorly trained police officers are putting your life in danger. We have all that and more coming up right now. You just stepped in to the Ring of Fire. You can't change Washington from the inside. You can only change it from the outside. Grand jury secrecy rules. For political gain. The press can find out. That has nothing to do with politics, but go ahead. It wouldn't bother me. Oops. <laughs> Corporate America hasn't paid their fair share of taxes in decades. And recently, we've seen several major corporations try to leave the United States just so they can save a few dollars on taxes. But the Obama administration is finally fighting back, and I have David Haynes with me now to tell us what this administration is doing to fight back against corporate tax cheats. David, there's no more, nothing more disgusting to me. You have corporations, they use our police departments, our firefighters, our streets, our infrastructure, they use our military when they want to be protected overseas. But when they don't want to pay taxes, they say, no, you know, we're going to go somewhere else and we're going to, we're going to call ourselves a foreign corporation. Our family's going to live here. Our family's going to use our schools and they're going to take advantage of all our colleges, universities. Uh, but we're not going to be Americans. You know, how, how nauseating is that? I mean, I guess it's nauseating to the point that Obama said, hell no, we're going we're gonna to do something about it. Finally, he let it go on for, for you know, for his entire time in office. F finally, the, the administration is uh, taking moves to begin to cl close these loopholes, and it is sickening, Pap. It, it just, it's just sickening that these companies, they will do any gamesmanship to, uh, you know, keep these millions and, and billions of dollars in profit uh, offshore, and as you say, they're, they're uh, just refusing to pay their fair share, and it's, it's nothing short of un-American. Well, the numbers are staggering. I mean, everybody who's looked at it, four different, four different sites, four different organizations that have looked at it, it says that the, that the American corporation pays somewhere between 12 and 13 percent taxes. So isn't it really, doesn't it come down to this? You could have them say, you know, you don't have to pay any taxes. And then before you know it, that corporation would be asking for handouts like sub, like subsidies and tax and, and, and other gifts from local government and, and the federal government. It, it's just a mentality that it seems irreversible right now, doesn't it? The, this corporate entity. It, it, it's a race. It's a race to the bottom. They, you know, corporate tax rates have, have come down historically over the last couple of decades and they still want more and more, and, and you're right. I mean, once they get to the rate till it's essentially nil, then they're going to want uh, subsidies and, and other incentives. And um, uh, you know, when you look at Apple, uh, probably the uh, largest uh, capitalization of any company in the world, their tax rate is estimated to be 8.2 percent, and they have billions offshore. I mean, really, when the American, uh, you know, working person, the working class, are paying taxes several times that rate. Uh, it just, just does not add up, and, and, and the Republicans have refused to take action, and finally the administration is doing something to try to close down these loopholes. Well, every time, every time there's been an attempt to where you've had, uh, you've had organizations ask for legislation to stop this, because what it also does is it ships jobs overseas, because in order for them to use this inversion, and they got all kinds of scams. I mean, one of them is called inversion. The other one is called diversion. Uh, it, it's it's the other one is called spin version, but basically what it does is takes jobs out of the country because in order, for example, for spin version to work, they have to have people in other countries working with the corporation, even though it really is an American corporation. But the person that that is that is doing the maybe it's a patent or maybe it's a new development of new technology. That person's from they have to hire from out of the country, so we lose the jobs there. And uh, the, the American citizen, you and me, we have to still pay for schools. We have to pay for roads. We have to pay for bridges. But these corporate pigs, there's no other way for me to describe it. It is corporate piggishness. They say, you know, we're above all that. We don't want to, uh, we don't want to pay taxes. This thing that the Supreme Court has said is a person. Well, it is a very piggish person if that's the situation, isn't it? That's right. These companies, uh, they can continue to be 
80% U.S. owned and still be deemed to be foreign corporations and still uh, avoid taxes that way. And so when you read these headlines about recent mergers like the Burger King and the John Horton deal with in, in Canada, that, that's a tax avoiding scheme. That's the only reason for that merger. And so as you said, these CEOs who are making tens of millions of dollars, they're not living in Ireland or in the Bahamas or wherever these other countries are where these tax loopholes exist. And uh, so it's all uh, just tax evasion year in, year out. And Speaker Boehner and the other Republicans and Mitch McConnell have refused to close these loopholes. And I wonder why. Well, I mean, the, the best the best description I heard of them it was an economist that called them international hyenas. They don't, they're, all they are is scavengers. In, in, in other words, you don't have a corporation that lives anywhere. <clears throat> in other words, you have a corporation that may have presence in a place like Germany, but they don't really live in Germany. What they do is like hyenas, they move all over the globe trying to extract country by country everything they can. And one thing they try to extract is these favors, these giveaways, these don't tax me and we'll do business. But I mean, it is a hyena piggish mentality that this thing that the Supreme Court has anointed as the person corporation, that's what this person is. They are, they're psychopaths. And, and we don't seem to do anything about it. Now, now that Obama has made at least this first move after, you know, six years, uh, what happens next? Is there any way that Congress is going to do anything with that? Well, it, 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 it seems, seems certainly unlikely. These corporations have been scrambling to try to get these deals done before the midterm elections in November. And so this uh, movement out of the budget office and Treasury is, is certainly designed to try to uh, uh, you know, it disincentivize them to, uh, to do these additional mergers, a number of which are pending and a number of which have just happened. And the net result is hundreds of billions of dollars in taxes that the Treasury needs that we're not getting. And, and the corporations are claiming, though, this money is stuck. It's stuck offshore. We can just bring it back into the U.S. where it belongs, pay your taxes, and you continue to do business. It's not stuck offshore. And no, it's unlikely that right now, unless we have a change in leadership in Congress, that we'll be able to get a meaningful uh, tax reform through. What does that mean, stuck offshore? It's their money. They can bring it back in the United States anytime. What they try to do is get these tax holidays where they say, okay, we, and th these are the numbers, two, at least a minimum of $2 trillion is offshore, where these corporations are keeping it offshore, making interest on it, but it's offshore. And that means if you, if you convert that, that's about seven or $800 billion dollars in tax revenue that the U.S. Treasury is missing out on. So, so at some point, don't we do something very heavy-handed? Doesn't it have to be something like Teddy Roosevelt would have done? And that's to say, you know, damn it, you either are an American citizen or you aren't. And when they make this move, don't we take away their U.S. citizenship? Don't we say, this person, this thing that this corporate person, you want to live over in Pango Pango and not pay any taxes, and you want to you want to pay your CEOs, uh, you know, fifty million dollars a year. You don't want to share anything with the American worker. Okay, well, you're not a U.S. citizen. We have the right to do that at some point. We can invoke the corporate death penalty for these corporations, and somebody's going to have to do it at some point. Exactly. We're going to need uh, we're going to need true enforcement. And, and what they're doing is they're creating all these subsidiaries that are not U.S. corporations, of course, that they're 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 foreign entities. But as you say, that the mothership continues to be the U.S. citizen and to have all the advantages here. And it's just true gamesmanship. We need re we need real reform. And you can bet if the Republicans had their way, they would roll out a tax holiday. All this cash would then be brought in and the American uh, taxpayers uh, would, and the Treasury would lose the benefit of all, all that money, which should be paid in, in the U.S. So this is a step in the right direction by the Obama administration. It's welcome, uh, but a lot, of, a lot more significant reform is desperately needed. Well, the only, the only reform these corporations understand is, A, take their money away. That's all they understand. A, a true psychopath, you, you know, you have to punish them. And the only way to punish them is to take their money away. And B, finally... But pray to God we start throwing some of them in jail, just like we do the character who sells, you know, two ounces of marijuana on a street corner. Throw these, throw these cats in Armani suit in prison, and then maybe somebody will start understanding that, you know, they have to play by the same rules that everybody else plays. Uh, David Haynes, thank you for joining me, okay? Thank you, Pat.
The right wing attack on education has done more than just make students a little less intelligent. It's completely dismantled a generation's critical thinking abilities, and that's exactly the kind of voter that the Republicans want. Joining me now to talk about this is Howard Nations. Howard, we saw an interview by Henry Garreau from Truth Out, and as I read the interview, uh, it was actually a story. It was a story that he did for Truth Out. And as I, as I was reading it, I thought about the idea that this is what we've talked about so many times, and that is the death of intellectualism in this country and the, tr- and the toll that it's taken. Now, we, we, you know, sometimes you and I joke about the death of intellectualism in Texas and in the South and how it's, it's, it's laughable, except it's so sad. Yeah. But, this, uh, but, but Henry did a great story talking about what is the toll of all that? What was your take on that truth out story? Well, he's right. Critical thought, democratic discourse has degenerated in the United States, but it's been replaced by this celebrity culture that embraces banality in its finest forms. It's been replaced by politicians that assault our senses with careless, uh, with ceaseless repetition of talking points from political consultants. It all comes from focus groups. You have Sarah Palin with her Obamacare death panels. Uh, repetition, repetition. You have media talking heads like Glenn Beck and Ann Coulter and Rush Limbaugh who have found a fortune telling the uh, intellectually uninitiated what they want to hear. And then of course you have the echo chamber at Fox News who understand very well the power of repetition. They have talking points, talking points, talking points that are unencumbered by facts, reason, or critical thought. And the whole thing's just designed to perpetuate the big lie that we live in a post-racial democracy that's free of racism or militarism or privatization or invasion of privacy. Well, there used, there's a term that, you, of course, that kicks out. There's called neoliberal. We've used right. it. People hear the term neoliberal. But really what it, what, it, 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 what it addresses is the fact that we used to, as progressives, think about things like, is it important that we live in an enlightened society? Is it important that we think about things besides making money, purely making money and going to war all the time? And and then all of a sudden, that progressive that used to be called a liberal made this bond with Wall Street. And now we have this thing called the neoliberal element, which is, you know, it's not that important that we educate our children. It's, it's not it's not in, important that we build great law b- libraries and that we have uh, that we have uh, great research facilities. It, it's just not important that we take care of things like our infrastructure and build parks. And, and so we've gotten so far down the road now. The toll is that that our youth, I mean, the young people are having to pay for this, aren't they? I mean, the, the, this, what they're going through because of this, this big shift is, is pretty awful. It's true. The, our customary arenas of critical thought, which are our schools, our universities, public radio, and the media, under siege. And they've been replaced by market-driven talking points supported, uh, supporting positions of corporate America and the financial services positions. And lost in the process is the actual debate that we should be having regarding inequality in wealth, inequality in power, opportunity, and income. And as you say, victimized in this whole process, the American youth. There's a distinct dichotomy in American youth among the affluent and the minorities and low-income whites. Youth is viewed today demographically. They're viewed for their purchasing power. They're a major consumer market. But if you're in that minority that has no purchasing power, what you end up with is degrading of the public schools, collapse of the safety nets, social safety net, economic safety net, and educational safety net, resulting in a downward mobility. Uh, to corporate America, if you have no commercial value, you have no value at all, except privatization of prisons, of course, and d- detention centers. So what we have now is we have youth coming out that uh, we've become so focused on, you know, taking care of corporations, uh, feeding the war machine, that now the, the corporations have taken all the jobs out of the, out of the country. Uh, therefore, we, you have kids coming through col- getting college degrees that can't get a job. Uh, you, have this, you have this focus on uh, most youth have grown up with this idea of buy and sell 
And so corporate America now has done the same thing with youth. I mean, you know, they're, 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 they're drawn to being, they're trained to be consumers. They're trained to look at the glitz and the glitter. And they're told it's really not that important that you understand big ideas like the classics. It's really not important in Texas, for example. What they've, do, they've done is changed the textbooks and removed critical thinking from the textbooks. Now, we're not making that up. We did a story on it. As a matter of fact, the latest thing is even more remarkable, where they tell the kids, you know, there's no such thing as global climate change. So what are we doing to these kids? What are they come? I mean, why would you hire anybody from Texas to work for your law firm? Well, you know, the result is exactly what you say, joblessness, inadequate education. Uh, the minorities being uh, targeted by the police. You have uh, decreased uh, opportunities to escape from all this. Solutions should include equal education, job training, adequate health care, but those things are gone by the boards. Uh, now you have uh, the situation you're talking about also occurred in Colorado. You had high school students who walked out in protest. They're protesting conservative censorship. Listen to this conservative censorship of United States history curriculum. The Denver Post reported that uh, they, they are trying to remove all mention of civil disobedience from the text, uh, from the classroom materials, anything that, that's teaching U.S. history. In a letter to a superintendent, one of the students said, I want honesty in my classroom and teachers want honesty in their classrooms. Uh, in Jefferson County and in, in Golden and in Arvada, uh, about 1,100 students walked out altogether, but teachers shut down high schools for two days. And the reason is they have this new conservative school board that wants to rewrite history to be more conservative. Uh, they say history teachers should be teaching nationalism, respect for authority, and listen to this one, reverence for the free markets. They should avoid historical events, civil disobedience, uh, social strife, and disregard of the law. In other words, they want to, in, in the U.S. history, they want to disregard the entire civil rights movement, they want to disregard the voting rights movement, and they want to disregard a thing called uh, the American Revolution. I think there's a little civil disobedience yeah, there. Yeah, so, so close down the idea of civil disobedience. God forbid our children should know that the only way we change things in this country <laughs> is go to the streets and raise hell. Now, okay, so that's a high school level. In colleges, you have, and by the way, the Koch brothers and that, that kind of right-wing bunch of fanatics started trying to uh, take over school boards all over the country. That's been going on now for almost 20 years, and yep. obviously it's successful. But at FSU, uh, a state university in Florida, the Koch brothers have bought an entire business school there where they make the determination of what's going to be taught, who the professors are, who's going to get hired, and who's going to get fired. You know, the FSU story, though, to me tells it all. What's your reaction to that? Well, my reaction, Mike, is very personal because I happen to be a graduate of Florida State University. I did my undergraduate work there, and I have been a contributor to Florida State University over the years. But when they called me most recently, after you and I did the, the uh, earlier segment that we did a few weeks ago about the Koch brothers literally buying the business school, buying the curriculum at Florida State University, having say so over the uh, choosing the faculty, uh, they call me for additional contributions, and I said, what, why would you possibly need your small pittance from me? You've got the Koch brothers backing you. And I'm sorry, even though I graduated from there, I can't back a school that sells its business school to the Koch brothers. So the fact of the matter is, uh, I not only don't contribute anymore to my own university, uh, but I also took them out of my will for exactly a million dollars. So, I <laughs> so, so there is there is some justice in this world, Howard. All right. Well, let's hope we can reverse some of this. Uh, it, it seems like a far stretch for us to do that because all we can really do is keep talking about it, keep it out there to where people understand that anti-intellectualism is alive and well, and it's killing the youth of this country. Thank you for joining me, Howard. My pleasure, Mike. The current Republican-controlled Congress has blocked every attempt by Democrats to stimulate both the economy and job growth. 
Instead of putting Americans back to work, Republicans have been sponsoring legislations to kill renewable energy, cut corporate taxes, and repeal the Affordable Care Act. All of this obstruction has come at a hefty price. I have David Hirsch with me now to explain what that obstruction is doing to the U.S. economy. David, for years we've been hearing the word obstruction, Republican obstruction, Republican uh, boneheads, Republican, you know, they, they can't get anything done. It's, it's, it's just one after another, week after week, we hear getting in the way of progress. But now we have, we can actually calculate what it did to us. We can actually calculate, these aren't just words anymore. Now we see there was a real substantial cost to these many years of obstruction. How do you see this, how do you see this story? You know, Pap, there's a very real cost to each and every one of us, and I think the most insidious cost is the deception of the American people. You know, we've seen tens of billions of dollars that have been lost in, in cost to us, whether it's from the budget impasse or the government shutdown. But the fact of the matter is our government has ground to a standstill because of the obstructionist tactics of the Republicans, but they've turned it on its ear, and now they're blaming uh, Obama's administration for the sad state of the economy and the the slagger, the the lagging in the recovery, when the obstruction that's been performed by the Republicans is actually the cause. So we're getting both the effect and then a public relations nightmare that just kind of turns things on its head and and lies to the public. Okay, so we saw. I mean, it, it's got, it started from almost day one, stopping Obama from doing anything to meaningfully lead the country. I mean, certainly from the economy standpoint, we, we've just been devastated. It's devastated our infrastructure. It's devastated our scientific research. Uh, it's, it's devastated the tax system to where the only people now paying taxes are the middle and middle class and below. Uh, anything above that, corporations, the 1%, all kinds of tax breaks, subsidies that nobody else gets. Uh, if you just go down the quick list in uh, 2011, the filibuster of Obama's infrastructure bill. We saw every economist that looked at it said this will create jobs, didn't they? they it, it absolutely would create jobs, and it's necessary not just to preserve our infrastructure, our aging roads, dams, other in, important infrastructure for our country, but potentially to improve them. But the filibuster that has prevented that from happening, the, six, the so-called 60-vote Senate, that prevents it from happening stands in the way of creating jobs. The Buffett rule, for example, where that would require millionaires and billionaires to pay the same kind of tax rate that middle Americans pay has been stopped in the Senate by this filibuster rule. The student uh, bill or the Student Debt Reform Act, which would allow students to refinance their student debt at a lower rate, was stopped by the Senate. We have a multitude Equal. of Let's bills go on. Let's stopped. go on with the list. The list is unbelievable. Equal pay for women stopped by the Senate filibuster. Uh, the the path forward on highway bill, which was to, to build new roads, build new bridges, make create jobs, stopped by the Republican filibuster. Creating jobs uh, and ending offshoring uh, of jobs, the attempt to stop offshoring jobs ended with the filibuster by the Republicans. New housing bill that would have allowed people to buy in the homes and make it, a, make it actually to where it would generate money in a particular community stopped by the Republicans. The, Extent, teacher, the teachers and first responders, you've got to be kidding me, a bill that would have put 400,000 teachers and first responders back to work stopped by the Senate. I, it's amazing the litany, Pap, that we have of, of what the Senate has done with this filibuster rule to prevent progress from going forward, and then they turn it on their ear and blame the Democrats saying, well, nothing's happening, and the economy is not recovering, when in fact they're really acting in a way that's anti-jobs and in favor of loosening the restrictions on things like regulation of coal ash, allowing transportation through the, the Keystone Pipeline of Canadian oil that's going to be sold to China, giving tax breaks to the oil companies. It, it, it's ridiculous. It destroys our economy. Now, there's another side to it. What, it while they were cutting and filibustering to try to improve, you know, to, to stop improving the economy, what were the Republicans coming forward with affirmatively? This really tells a story, doesn't it? 
the the uh, the budgetary plan that the that the Republicans have brought forward and they've actually put on the table uh, cuts economic incentives to businesses, limits the critical spending on infrastructure, give tax breaks to the large oil companies. Uh, like I said, approves the Keystone Pipeline, which allows Canada to sell its oil to China, which means that consumers in America are going to be paying more for their oil and their gasoline, uh, blocks regulations of coal ash, which is important for our health and well-being and our, uh, the economy as well. And so what we have is we have in the House, we have the so-called Hastert Rule, which kind of uh, Newt Gingrich was, was kind of the guy who started all this. But unless the majority of the majority approves it, then Boehner's not going to let it come up to a vote. The only thing that gets put forward is what is in the best interest of the economic backers of the Republican parties, which means that we have economic bills that back big business, that back the oil and gas industry, and everything else gets left on the table, off the floor, unable to be voted well, on. Well, just to put that in perspective, paralysis. yeah, to put that in perspective, there was a bill that they came forward. They called it the "Keep IRS Off of Your uh, <laughs> Health Care," <laughs> and basically, what what that was was just a way to attack Obamacare. It didn't really do anything for anybody. The Electricity Security and Affordability Act, uh, it was called, and that was to protect coal fire uh, plants from any kind of regulations at all. That's what they came forward with. Um, the um, the Quality Charter Schools Act, where they wanted to give money to quality schools and at the same time uh, to charter schools uh, that they called quality. The same schools, by the way, that the FBI today is raiding and taking, you know, they're, they're under huge investigations. People have been arrested, put in prison already for charter schools. Uh, the approval of expanding oil and gas production in the Gulf of Mexico after... Uh, after the Exxon spill, I mean, excuse me, the, the, the BP spill that cost this entire Gulf Coast billions, if not uh, if not trillions of dollars but by the time it's all over. So that that's the other side of what they're doing there in, and while they're help, in Congress. Help me understand this. How the Republican Party passes bills that limit the funding that's available for public schools, public school teachers, jobs for public school teachers, while at the same time advancing these charter school programs, how, how is that rationally related to improving the economy, helping get our teachers back to work, improving the educational competition that American students have with foreign uh, that are competing for our jobs? That doesn't fit at all. In other words, your point, your point is they put all these things I just talked about under their budget bill, correct? That's right. Yeah. That's right. It's all just a public relations scam. As you said before, they list things as being job-related and... The public looks at it and says, oh, well, they must be in favor of creating jobs, when, in fact, when you look at it, they're taking away funding for jobs. They're reducing the amount of public education funding that's available so that our students don't have a chance of being able to compete on what the increasingly international marketplace. You it's, watch, it's David, the, the American public will do it again. They will put these same boneheads back in office even more of them this time, simply because they don't have either the skill set or the desire to find out what in the hell is happening to them. David Hirsch, thank you for joining me, okay? Thanks, Pat. Appreciate it. Stories about police officers shooting and killing minorities are becoming far too common. Nearly every week, police officers in America kill an African-American citizen, a Latino. There's several reasons for this epidemic. I have blogger Chauncey DeVega with me to tell us what those reasons are and what we can do about it. Chauncey, it's very difficult to even watch the South Carolina trooper scene of this idiot police officer jumping out of his car unloading four shots. Thank goodness he was so poorly trained because he only hit the man one time out of four. W w intended to shoot to kill him, though. What, w I mean, what driving while black, we've all heard the term, but man, if this doesn't sum it up, they stopped him for his seatbelt, for God's sakes. It's really the worst of what we would call racial paranoiac thinking. It's, you know, the shooting incident, and thank goodness the, the gentleman survived. I mean, we have racial, we have incompetence on the part of the police, plus racial animus and what we call implicit bias, which is really a very deep sort of internalized subconscious hostility towards people of color. And as I wrote on my own site, chaunceydevega.com, and also over at the Daily Cost, I said this should not be a surprise. 
Um, it's great when our white brothers and sisters are shocked and surprised at what is a grievous event, and also with Eric Garner and Michael Brown. But black and brown folks and others have been talking about this sort of police brutality for centuries. It really is horrific. Well, there is one way to solve it. The only way, uh, you see, th this officer lives with the fact that that went viral, that we had a video camera that was on him. It showed, uh, it showed the world what an incompetent boob he was. But also what it showed is something that he's got to live with. I mean, he looked like a frightened little schoolgirl rather than doing anything deliberate, rather than, you know, if he had a doubt, get your hands in the air, step behind your car. They're trained what to do, how to do it. This guy fell to pieces because he was so, he was so terrified. It was, it was almost like a, a, a school child kind of fear that we saw there. So he has to live with that. It's on the camera. It's going to follow him the rest of his life. And so what I love is the idea of why not put body cams on all these police officers, they're very small. I mean, you know, you put them on a badge, for God's sake. What's your reaction to that? I mean, we need more accountability, and you're spot on. Body cameras would be a great start, but then we need to make sure that that data persists in the database. And we also need to really strengthen citizens' review boards so that the people who are policed by these officers actually have a voice and a say in terms of consequences. A lot of the general public don't understand that, number one, it's very hard to prosecute a police officer. Uh, never mind the fact that without the body cameras, they can lie, they can distort, they can twist the facts. So the body cameras are an important start, but we need to make sure that citizens are on review boards and that that data is available to the general public. Well, what we would have had here had there not been a camera, we didn't even have the, 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 the full uh, scene. I mean, the man was on the ground saying, I'm sorry, you know, please don't shoot. Here's my, here's my driver's license. I mean, the police officer asks him, get your driver's license. He reaches in to get his driver's license. And then the buffoon cop jumps around like Barney Fife and just starts wildly firing. The guy's on the ground. He says, please, I'm sorry. Well, he said that because he was really in fear that this idiot might shoot to kill while he's on the ground. He says, here's my license. Now, the we, we, so we lost part of that. We only got part of the scene. But if, the, if he's required to wear a body camera, we would have seen the whole thing from top to bottom. And, um, and, and, and the good that comes out, there's no he said, she said. There's none of these fictitious stories that we often hear police officers make. I thought he was going for a gun. You know, he's belligerent. We would see all that. I mean, it seems to solve the problem, doesn't it, Chelsea? It's a good start, but we also need to address police training. There's actually a whole body of research from social scientists, psychologists, and others that measures how and why police make the decision to shoot unarmed people. And one of the findings that you repeatedly see in the literature is that white police officers, all things being equal, are more likely to shoot unarmed black people in computer simulations than they are white people. And they're also more likely to take extra time in deciding whether to shoot an unarmed, an armed white person than a black person. So this is also a training issue because training can help to nullify some of these deeply learned and pernicious racist stereotypes about African Americans and black men in particular. Well, one thing that one thing that's obvious is everybody should not be a police officer. I mean, we we if you take a look at how uh, I saw a great article. You know, these a lot of these guys are you know they're outstanding high school football players. They don't make college. Uh, you know, so they end up uh, on the police force. They they come back from from uh, military action where they really never saw military action, but they were they were they were over there. They come back and they're made police officers. So we have this we have this notion that just anybody can do it. The truth is, most great police officers, and there's some very very good ones out there. I mean, you know that that understand that look. This is a dangerous business I'm in. I can't act like a frightened schoolgirl. They have to have a presence of mind, and they have to have a, a sense of deliberateness when they, when they do this job. Not everybody has that. This guy obviously didn't have it. So it almost comes down to a profiling. You almost have to do a, uh, uh, you know, MMPI kind of profile to find out, is this guy in his heart just a coward that shouldn't be out there? I mean, don't you think that would be helpful? I think it's a psychological profile issue, but we also have to pressure those good cops to break the blue wall of silence and say, you know what, cops like this make us all look bad. Most of us are trying to do our job in a highly stressful environment, but we have incompetence around us, we have racists around us, and we need to stand up and get them out of our own force. So that's one issue we need to address. But we also have to double down on the fact that what's going on here with these police shooting unarmed African Americans and other black folk at least every 28 hours in this country. I mean, it's a frightening statistic when you read about this. This really is, in a lot of ways, a new age type of lynching. And it's deeply, deeply disturbing. So we need to address the specific behavior of the police, 
but also institutional and cultural racism in this society. This is, hey, black men are inherently dangerous. It's okay to shoot them. And the general public, in many cases, will actually support the behavior. So we well, need to have a two-prong approach. Yeah, most, most great police officers, and let me, again, let me emphasize, the tragedy here is that the good officer has to watch this bonehead where this video is shown all over the country, and all of a sudden they start painting police officers with the same broad brush. A police officer who does have the courage to be a police officer doesn't do what we saw that guy do. Most police officers that are really good ones, they're, they're, they're colorblind. They're just trying to do it. Here's the methodology. Here's what I was trained. Step one, step two. And so it, body cameras... A good police officer probably isn't going to worry about wearing a body camera that's as big as the head of a pen. I mean, actually, the body camera can go right on the badge, and so it runs all the time. They have, they could, they have standards where they can cut it off if they're in the police house and they're having a private conversation. They're not then, but we're in the line of duty. It runs. And where they're using these already, they say, look, you may not turn it off. As a matter of fact, if you turn it off more than a couple of times, I think there are certain sanctions that they get. But uh, the, the truth is a good police officer should want that, shouldn't he? I would think because, number one, it's going to minimize them being the targets of frivolous lawsuits. And number two, if you're a good cop, you have nothing to hide. You have nothing to be ashamed of. And it's a win-win for all parties involved. But we also have to be careful where even when we have video footage, there was that shooting in Walmart where you had an unarmed African-American holding a BB gun who was shot dead by the police, and it was recorded by the store video, and the police were still given the permission of having a clean kill. So we need to also, like you say, have the body cameras, have citizens involved, and make sure that the police understand that this is a win-win. And hopefully that will force out these incompetent and corrupt and racist police officers who really have no business being a police officer to begin with. Yeah, well, I mean, we we got a long way to go, don't we? And uh, unfortunately, if you if you're one of the good if you're one of the good ones, and you've been in this, you're, you're serious about your career. Uh, every time you see another one of these videos, whether it's Ferguson, whether it's this one in South Carolina, whether it's you know wherever, where you see police officers poorly trained, uh, just don't have the mental capacity to do this job. They're either afraid or they simply have an ugly, ugly side to them. They shouldn't be out there. The good police officer, I think, really suffers from that. And uh, uh, I think unions, police unions, ought to get that under control as soon as they can. Uh, Chauncey, thank you for joining me, okay? Thank you for having me. My next guest is longtime and friend, colleague, and political activist who also happens to be one of the most influential trial lawyers in America. He spent five decades fighting for American consumers. He's received countless awards and honors, dozens and dozens of multi-million dollar verdicts on behalf of consumers. He truly is one of the best trial lawyers in America. But before he even began his career, he had to overcome some very deep prejudices in the South in order to be accepted, to even be accepted as a trial lawyer. His biography titled, And Give Up Showbiz? Well, it was recently released, and I have Fred Levin here now to talk about his story. Fred, out of all the reviews that I've read about your book, but by the way, is, is, is something everybody ought to understand and read, because it has, it's not just about a lawyer. And that, the, the most interesting review I read talked about how you growing up with anti-Semitism really had a huge impact on how uh, you, you, you moved through your career. I, explain that. I mean, I thought this was the best review done. Out of everything in that book, this is what they picked out. Well, to start with, um, you ne I never realized anti-Semitism as I was growing up in Pensacola, Florida. Even though I could not go to the country club or, or be a member of the country club, then I went off to college and there was the first time I realized what a major difference there was. Uh, I had grown up with a lot of non-Jewish young men and we went off to the University of Florida together. I had assumed that we were all going to go to the same fraternity. They all went SAE, and then they had to come tell me that the, the day before the uh, bids went out that I could not be a member of SAE because I was Jewish. So that was the first time I what, really, Okay, so what year are we talking about? Well, this would have been 1954. 54, and so before then you, were, you grew up in a town, Pensacola, Florida, 
that uh, honestly, I don't think it was till the mid 80s where they even allowed Jews in the country club. It was something as outrageous as that. But I think what, what interests me about the review that I read was that at the heart of what your career was about was some element of anger about that. In other words, you grow up as a child, anti-Semitism, I can't imagine how bad it was in the South. I, I saw it down in the South where I lived, but it was apparently very bad up here. You say, well, things are going to be different in college. And then you go off to college in the anti-Semitism that we, we've almost forgotten about it, haven't we, in the United States? We've forgotten that right now anti-Semitism is at a world high. Yes. The, uh, what was interesting back in Pensacola as I was growing up in the early 50s was I think that I accepted the fact that I could not be a member of the country club, couldn't go to the country club. Uh, and I, blacks were basically the same. I think they were accepting it. They just, there was a colored fountain and a, a, a white fountain. There was a colored bathroom and a white bathroom. These were in the courthouses. So I went off to college, uh, and that's the first time I really realized that there was a significant difference. Then as I started into law school, the same thing. You, I could not be a member of a particular legal fraternity, and uh, I started to become angry. And I also, I happened to enter law school with the first black to enter uh, a white public institution in Florida. And that's another whole story that's in the book. By the way, the book uh, is called In Give Up Showbiz. But uh, I became angry, and as a result, as you well realize in a trial, you put down all the cheap shots that are being taken to the very end. Well, I looked at anti-Semitism, racism as cheap shots. And I worked harder and harder and harder at it and uh, became successful even though I, I really, uh, I guess if you did a IQ test on me, I'd be pushed just to get to be average. But okay, well, well let, let's, talk, let's talk about what this means. Let's, let me put it in perspective a little bit. When I, when I, when I look at, the, at uh, two of these reviews, they, every, each one of them, identifies that underlying element of anger. Well, what did, that, what did it result in? Well, it resulted in you changing the tobacco industry by actually being the person who started the big fight against the U.S. tobacco. It enabled you to get, I think, at one point, more multi-million dollar verdicts against really corrupt corporations than any lawyer in America. It allowed you to to not only do those things, but to do a lot of great social things. And and so I, I think the point is that anti-Semitism seemed to have a big, big factor tied into the anger, which I hope is what made all that happen. It has a lot to do with it. You know, I think back, my brother David graduated number two in the law school class, the University of Florida, back in, I guess, the late 40s. He couldn't get a job in... Pensacola, uh, with any of the major firms, had to start off and actually joined up with Reuben Askew, became Levin and Askew, and of course he became the greatest governor of Florida scene. Then I got out. Uh, it what just was it, it wasn't what was available. It, what it, was it, it like it, trying to get a job is in a silk stocking corporate law firm when you got a law school? <laughs> well, just describe well, it. it. It wasn't going to happen. I mean, they weren't recruiting Jewish lawyers for you know, these are the uh, Ivory League, uh, I mean the Ivory Tower law firms. These were the guys who represented the power companies, the banks, the, uh, and that just, w they just weren't going to do it. So when I started practicing law, it was you could either be a personal injury lawyer, a criminal lawyer, or a divorce lawyer, and that's and Le door, doors were closed. Were. Where it came to silk stocking firms, doors oh. were closed. Again, let's let's put this in perspective. What year are we talking about here? What's the year? Oh, for? gosh, this is in the early 60s. I mean, keep in mind, in the early 60s, this was oh, uh, long after Brown versus the Board of Education, that I suggested that the Bar Society in Pensacola invite the, a black member to become a member of the Bar Association. And, oh, I, I mean, it was horrible. They voted, I think, a hundred and something to like six not to accept him. I, 
that was in 61, 62, 63. Well, right? let me jump forward. I, there was a part in the book I, I just find, I, I almost find it not believable, but I've confirmed that it is believable. You wanted to buy a house in Pensacola, Florida, <laughs> next to a country club. Do you know, that, tell me the story that I read and I said, well, did that really happen? Yes, that happened. I was, that would have been in the late, 70s even maybe early 80s early 80s it was yeah, yeah. it was probably the early 80s and yeah uh, we needed a, a home there were a lot of reasons but so <laughs> I took the children we went to visit I uh, we went to look at this home a beautiful home that was uh, uh, right near the country club and it happened to be on a Thursday afternoon and my kids were young at that point and they were running around the house in the yard and everybody going to the country club to play golf would see this <laughs> these kids running around the next day i got a call from a friend and he said fred uh, you really don't want to uh, uh, buy that house do you i said well it, it may fit perfectly for my family he said well how do you think your kids are going to feel having to look in from a fence at the other kids playing tennis and golf and swimming and they'd not be allowed in it so, I uh, what was that your really, really that upset me, and I, that probably more than anything. And I went back, and after a couple of sleepless nights, uh, I called him and I said, uh, "You know, you're right." And I, I said, "Oh, I know." In it, my, in fact, my father uh, had just become a widower, and I said, "You know, he really doesn't have an awful lot to be doing." So I think I'm going to buy it for a, a Jewish progressive club where all of them can come and play gin rummy uh, and that was on a I don't remember but two days later the house sold <laughs> they all put their money <laughs> to together somebody. well w one, th one thing that I, I saw in one of these interviews is that 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 reaction to having grown up and being exposed to anti-semitism not only made you a great civil rights uh, advocate you were all through your career a huge civil rights advocate but it also um, it also did some things that I thought was important. It's almost like it was almost as I kind of looked at it as like rubbing it in their face just a tad, yeah. which I think is a natural tendency. I, I, I remember when you when you had your name put on the University of Florida Law School. Tell, tell that story and put it into perspective and, and tell me the truth about why you did that. All right. What what happened is uh, as. I became uh, uh, more and more successful in the practice of trial law. I created enemies and I didn't mind getting in their face. And a as a result, uh, the Bar Association was down on me and that's another whole story that's in the book. But after tobacco, there was a lot of money in lawyers' fees and I was going to give it away anyhow and it just happened that the opportunity presented itself to give it to the University of Florida College of Law and change the name to the Frederick G. Levin College of Law. <laughs> and I did it, and you would have thought the world had come to, I mean, it was just incredible. A, a, a lot of the silk stocking guys were writing letters. And there's no uh, question, that, that, no question, it was, it was also, even at that late date, what year are we talking about? This would have been 98. Somewhere around there. There was even there that element of anti-Semitism rolled they, up. They, uh, well, there was the, the only indication of that was uh, the dean of the law school was a guy named Dean Matazar. And uh, he indicated that some of the calls that he got were uh, anti-Semitic. What they did not realize was that Dean Matazar was Jewish. <laughs> so he told me about it. Of course, the dean lost his job, the president of the university lost their job because these, the silk stocking people were really upset. But one thing that I, I have a little bit of a good feeling about is that years from now, long after I'm gone and their great, great, great grandchildren of these guys go up on that stage to get that diploma from the University of Florida Levin College of Law, it's going to have my name on it. <laughs>
<laughs> well, look, Fred, good book. Uh, it, it's it's one that people are going to see right up here on the screen. They can get it from Amazon. There's a lot of places, ways to get it. But if, if I drill down and I read the most important parts of the book, it's not that you changed law in such a huge way. You obviously did. But it is that uh, I was most interested in the idea of what drove you there. And, and under underneath all that, we think we dismiss anti-Semitism as if it's gone. We dismiss it as if it never really happened in the United States. We think the only place it happened was in Berlin. But the truth is, uh, when I talk to people like you that have been professionals and grown up in various professions, it's very evident that it's, it's been with us a long time. Fred Levin, thank you for joining us, okay? Thank you. Fred Levin's biography is called And Give Up Showbiz, and you can find a link on ringoffireradio.com. The week started off with a, uh, a massive climate protest in New York City, then more protests in New York City uh, to uh, take place simultaneously as um, states, uh, nations were meeting at the UN, uh, a major address by President Obama on uh, climate change. Uh, we also heard from the Chinese. Um, I, I, I don't know if we're going to see any action, actual action, <laughs> but it's nice to hear the rhetoric. <laughs> well, we're, we're kind of used to that, aren't we, with this president? You know, we're, we're and this, certainly this this Congress is just a bunch of, uh, you know, rhetoric and then it dies away. But look, this is the biggest, for what, 400,000 climate march in history. And Fox and major media outlets treated it like it was a tree falling in the forest. Uh, nobody to hear it, nobody to see it. Like, you know, gee whiz, yawn. What, what was that all about now? But if, if there had been 15 teabagger crazies out on a street corner in Paducah, America, with uh, sidearms and holding up Obama protest signs with you know, butchered English in the pictures of Obama depicted as Hitler, then we would have seen this endless stream of video and this endless shallow, dull-brained reports about how significant that crowd of 15 Looney Tunes word of the political narrative. So, you know, uh, what it struck me, Sam, is any politician with a brain should have been out there because more and more we're beginning to see that uh, that, that uh, we're beginning to see the show of people's anger. That it might eventually uh, trump even the billions of dollars that's being tr uh, pumped into this uh, destruction of our planet. So, I, I just I was amazed. I mean, what Bernie Sanders was there, Sheldon Whitehouse was there, Al Gore was there, because because they have openly declared that they don't want or need Exxon money to survive politically. You were there. Yeah, I, I, I was. And uh, our old friend Mike Malloy was there. My my entire family was was actually out there. I mean, there was there was a lot of people there. And um, and like I said, there was there was also protesters uh, part of flood Wall Street uh, the next day, about 100 or so. Uh, were arrested in uh, some civil disobedience. You know, there was an interesting piece I saw in the Washington Post uh, by uh, Max Ehrenfreund, who, who basically said, look, the bottom line, like you uh, uh, suggested, the, the, the bottom line that w as to why we're not seeing more aggressive action, why we can't get anything through the, uh, the House or the Senate at this point, is because uh, the fossil fuel industry spent you know, a half a billion dollars uh, lobbying in uh, the last, uh, the 2010 election cycle. And so we're stuck with those politicians. Um, I have to say that I think to a certain extent, you know, President Obama, this is, this is one of those few places, I believe, where the president is genuinely handcuffed uh, by Congress and is doing just about everything that is available to him to do um, you know, the, the, the rising of the of the um, uh, the uh, uh, the mileage standards for cars has done um, has 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 moved in the right direction. Some of the things taken uh, steps by the EPA has moved in the right direction. This past week, he announced by executive action that um, a foreign aid was going to be tied into uh, what steps were being taken by those recipient countries to deal with carbon emissions. Um, he, you know, this is, this is a real, this is a real failure in many respects of our democracy. I mean, 
when I, you know, I know that we've both, you know, spoken to people in the past who say, you know, sometimes like our constitution is a little bit problematic. This is one of those times where our government is a, because of essentially Republican intransigence uh, is incapable of addressing what is a a genuine crisis. And when you compare the ease in which we commit millions, if not trillions of dollars to military action, the the notion that uh, nobody even wants, Congress doesn't even want a part of having to approve it. Uh, the president can take executive authority under very questionable legal grounds. The ease in which we can actually wage war versus how difficult it is to respond. To save the planet, yeah. To the planet, it is yeah, we, stunning. We have, look, we have, uh, I guess what's, what is uh, so agonizing about it is you almost realize that there's nothing that can be done while we have, while we have the Republicans in Washington, and 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 I'd like to say it's just Republicans, but really, you know, look underneath us. There was a time when every credible scientist, uh, you know, it, it were, every credible scientist in the world, is pleading with Washington to do something now. In, in a time when we're moving into this partial extinction cycle, when the world's largest insurance mega corporations they're they're all admitting that this is one of the most important economic potential catastrophes in their number crunching radar that's what the insurance companies are saying the pentagon is turning out at least a half a dozen reports that confirm that climate catastrophe is the top threat to international security but all all but th all but three democrats can't get off their fat butts to show up at the rally or comment on the rally. And of course, there were zero Republican politicians there because they have two, they've been ordered around just like the Democrats were ordered around by their zillionaire oil bosses not to show up. So we remain in this tick tock countdown mentality because no one except average citizens gives a damn enough about their children to react to the fact that as late as last year, Sam, the world pumped more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than any time in world history. That's it for this week's Ring of Fire, but you can keep up with us throughout the week online at ringoffireradio.com, on Twitter at Ring of Fire Radio, and on Facebook. I'm Mike Papantonio. We'll see you next week right here on Ring of Fire.